everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Anabaptist Perspectives. We're here in Brooklyn, New York City with Alan Roth. And if I understand right, you moved here in 1986 and were involved in leadership um, at the Followers of Jesus Church, which is where we're at right now. Can you walk me through that? How, when was that church started and, and why did you come here? What was the vision that, that brought it about? Well, we had moved back to the U.S. from Central America with a plan to go to a Muslim country in South Asia. But we wanted in the interim to get a team together planting a church, get them started and then we would move on. And through an unusual series of events uh, which began during some days of prayer and fasting, the idea was presented that we would come to New York City to find a pastoral couple who are friends of ours from New York and that if, without telling them what we had in mind, if they would invite us to help them start a church, that would be the sign. And so, through some really miraculous events, we found them. It was very unusual. It was like looking for a needle in a haystack. And they did invite us to come and help get a church started. We moved here in November of 86 with two other couples and a single with a goal to plant a church here. So there was nothing here at that point? We started in a very grungy, unfinished basement. And then a couple months later, we were run out of there. And then we found another basement. And then the church continued to grow. We rented space then. We, the church met in like seven different spaces over a period of 17 years before we were able to buy our own property. Is that what we're on that's right now? That's what we're on right yeah. now. Okay. We bought half of a building. So <laughs> <laughs> that's where we are right now. Nice. So that's how we got started here and really didn't expect to be here longer than a year or so. But I noticed that when people asked us, especially new believers, how long are you going to be here? And I'd tell them, oh, six to 12 months. It's just sort of like this chill effect. Mm, yeah. And one day, it just the Lord brought it very clearly to my attention. You know, don't say that. Just say, we'll be here as long as the Lord wants us until he raises up faithful leadership. And, and did that happen then? Mm -hmm. So as the years went by, then the church was established with a membership, a leadership team established. So as a church, and then thinking back of the original vision, what, how would you define success for what you're trying to do here? To me, success in church planning looks like winning local people and incorporating them into the church, and then some of them becoming leaders in the church itself. Mm -hmm. Have you all done that here then? Yes. Mm, not to the a degree that our ideals had envisioned it, but yes, over the years there have been people from uh, the area here who have become part of the leadership team. What was your methods to, to bring all this about, and then also which parts would you say were the most effective? Well, in the beginning we did a lot of track distribution. That was scary for us, but it's n not as scary as some other methods. <laughs> But it is an impersonal method, and as time has gone on, I've seen that the most powerful methods are the most personal methods. We did a lot of door-to-door -door work, like with questionnaires, surveys, and so on, and then mm -hmm. uh, offer to pray for people, offer to start Bible studies in their homes. I would consider that to be more effective. That's even scarier, going door-to-door. -door. Nobody likes it, Yeah. But, uh, but then when you find people, then they're right there in your neighborhood. Yeah. You don't have to go far. Yeah. And they begin to watch you and see if you're the real deal or not. Mm -hmm. We've done open air preaching, like at the platforms of the train stations or in a nearby shopping area. That gives uh, public, makes public awareness, mm -hmm. which is good. But then when you want to follow up people, then it's hard because they're from everywhere. And so in the beginning days, we used to go all over this city trying to follow up on people. And finally, we just kept narrowing it down. It's just going to be Brooklyn. Yeah. It's just going to be East Brooklyn. It's just going to be within a radius of about six blocks mm -hmm. that we focus on. We, uh, we chose deliberately not to get vans to transport people for church, but to work primarily within walking distance here in the community. 
okay. and we figured that if uh -huh. people can get to shopping and jobs by train and bus and car, then they can get to church that way too. Mm -hmm. And so that was an early decision that influenced our focus. <clears throat> a lot of home Bible studies, um, and the church was actually started and met in, in homes until we were forced out and then began meeting in public spaces like a local Methodist church or a local Pentecostal church or the YMCA until we were able to purchase this building. So I would say really over the years the most powerful ways are the most simple and personal. And it seems like a lot of it too was you started really broad mm -hmm. and then you started realizing let's, let's mm -hmm. focus this in mm -hmm. more. Yeah, that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. yeah, another method we used was would be children's and youth ministry, like kids okay. clubs, um, Bible camp or camps outside, week camps or weekends outside the city, and then we started the school here as well too. Yeah, well, I was wondering about that. How long has your school been going? Which is this a classroom here that, that we're in? This is one of the classrooms. One of the classrooms. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, twenty years now, I think, or twenty-two years. Oh, we've wow. had the school. Oh, I didn't realize it's that long. Now, here's one observation of mine. There's been a ton of energy and work invested, like in kids' clubs, in uh, camps, summer camps, and in the school too. And it's all valuable, very useful. However, I would say from the perspective of church planting, it has not been that fruitful. And so this is the logo that I've come up with, the motto. If you're going to do children's ministry, follow the children home. Go meet those parents, share the gospel with them, invite them to church, build relationships with them. Because what we've discovered is that as children grow and they enter their teens, if they don't have that support network, they tend yeah. to drop out. And very few of them end up being with us. That may have been partly our fault that we did not mobilize ourselves to really maximize those contacts in trying to build relationships with the parents and start mm -hmm. Bible studies with them and so forth. Well, yeah, and that's, that was one of the things I was wondering is what did growth look like um, for this church here and then just in general? Uh, what does that look like? Most of our growth has come through personal contacts. There have been some that have, a few that have come through literature distribution um, but then it tends to follow the contacts of those persons with people they know. It's good to do widespread as well because it helps to create an awareness. It plants seeds. It helps bless other ministries as well as people become aware of the gospel. But from the perspective of church planting and local church growth, it needs to be personal, mm -hmm. simple, reproducible, and over and over again. I think one thing where where I look back and I think maybe it was an error strategically when uh, prior to having the school started we used to uh, mobilize to go out once a week either door to door or visiting contacts that had been made in their homes when we were organizing to get the school started I said to myself I've got too much administrative stuff to do we can't keep that up we let that go and I I think it would be fairly accurate to say if, if you would chart our growth as a church over those years that once we entered that phase of getting our school started we sort of leveled off mm, okay. because we weren't investing as much in personal witnessing in the neighborhood. It's almost like you're saying don't go really wide, go really deep mm -hmm. with the people you interact mm -hmm. with. Let's narrow it in a little. Can you tell me a specific incident or story that you would say was a, a time of success for you and for this church? One that, that came to my mind was the purchase of this building without mm -hmm. any indebtedness. It was just an amazing story without fundraisers of how God provided. Um, but I won't go through that long story. But it was just, it's something that we've often looked back at as being a mile marker and how God really mm -hmm. did something amazing there. Another one I would say is that when Daniel and June Pollard were added to the leadership team, mm -hmm. um, there was a season in which Matt and Eleanor Alert 
as a licensed deacon, I think it was, were on the leadership team as well. Those were uh, special times. Each of the times when, prior to buying this building, when the church was forced to move to another spot, mm -hmm. I always thought it was the devil that was at work, and maybe he was. But each time it turned out being for good and opened mm -hmm. up the way for the church to grow some more. That's the last question I had, but is there anything else you would like to share? Well, for all of those who are watching, I would say please do consider the possibility of being involved in church planting. Mm -hmm. uh, I read a book, the book, The American Church in Crisis, which studied churches for a five-year period between the year 2000 and the year 2005. <coughs> mm -hmm. And coming out of that, the author said that on a given Sunday morning, nine out of ten Americans will not be in any church at oh. all. And in this country, there are 190 million unchurched people. And if you take mm. all of them and put them together in one nation, it would be the fifth, the fifth most populous nation in the world. Mm. And <clears throat> I remember reading a, a note from history that mm. at the time of the French Revolution, which was a, a godless, and bloody revolution. The historian mentioned that England was ripe for the same kind of bloody revolution. But what England had was George Whitfield and the Wesley brothers. Mm -hmm. And especially the Wesleys, because they not only preached, but they gathered people together in small groups, which became Methodist churches. Mm -hmm. And that spared England that bloody godless revolution. And I'm thinking about what's happening in America and in Canada and the, the, the wholesale departure from Judeo-Christian values. And I'm thinking the hope of North America is in church planting, calling people to discipleship following Jesus and gathering together in committed fellowships of believers. So if there are any young people or not so young people who are watching, I would say, please, Consider the possibility that God might be calling you to a life mm -hmm. ministry of being involved in church planting. Mm -hmm. That's powerful. Thank you very much you're for welcome. sharing. Yeah, you're and, and when also your example of, of having walked this path and then sharing what you've learned. I think that's, that's really important for people to hear that. Yeah. Well, if God could take a timid farm boy from Oregon and <laughs> plop him down in New York City and have him survive, he can, I think maybe he can do it for most anybody. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good way of saying it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for You're sharing. You're welcome. I appreciate My pleasure. It. Yeah. <laughs>